Welcome to the AZ Political Podcast. I'm Jim Sharp. And, you know, usually I start the podcast with, you know, three headlines. But this week, headlines number one, two, and three are abortion. Because the Arizona legislature devolved into shouts of shame, shame, as Republican leaders shut down any discussion on a repeal of Arizona's 1864 law that criminalizes almost every abortion in the state. This after the state Supreme Court, of course, earlier this week, paved the way for enforcement of that Civil War era law that predates Arizona's statehood by almost half a century. So I already broke it to my guest this week that we're going to talk about abortion. And my guest this (laughs) week on the AZ Political Podcast is Chuck Coughlin, uh, who was named five times by the Arizona Capital Times as Arizona's best political operative. I can't even... It doesn't really flow off the tongue quite. No, far. nothing political operative really works <laughs> anymore. Everybody just thinks you're yeah. evil genius yeah. when you say yeah, that, right? It's, uh, it's troubling. <laughs> Chuck, CEO and president of uh, political consulting firm High Ground Incorporated. So, uh, did what happened here make abortion the number one campaign issue and at least for this week, make Arizona an even more important state in the 2024 election, like we weren't already enough with our swing state status. Yeah, it, there's a lot there. And it, it is certainly lit a fire underneath uh, this, ele- this election season mm-hmm. uh, from, a, from a topical standpoint. Um, it has put significant wind at the back like they really didn't need it uh, of the um, of the reproductive rights uh, coalition, yeah, um, and it's put clearly Republicans in a defensive posture, uh, and so there's a lot going on. Um, I suspect, as all things, that will shift over the next 45 days. We'll have a different chapter to talk about here mm-hmm. because the way the court wrote the ruling is there's different avenues to pursue here. But as of today, yeah, it's it's like a meteor hit a lake. I mean, there yeah. is a there is a massive amount of tidal shift going on right it's now. It's not ripple effects. No. It's tidal wave right. effects right. At, the, at this point. <clears throat> so uh, this ruling obviously didn't help Republicans. Uh, um, even though it matches what a lot of strident pro-life Republicans say they wanted. Ultimately, if they lose the majority in the state House or state Senate because of this issue, it puts them in a position, too, where they can't, you know, shape abortion policy at all. Right. Yeah. I mean, they were uh, they, they were already on the defensive in this cycle, as you noted, with a one seat majority in both chambers. Mm-hmm. Um, By anybody's calculation, there's at least uh, four Democratic, three or four Democratic pickup opportunities. There's really only one um, Republican pickup opportunity in the cycle. So, you know, smart money's on a shift or at least a tie. Um, if if they could pull that off, and to your point, yeah, that changes the whole balance of power in terms of uh, policy making going forward. You'll now have a Democratic governor, even with a split legislature, that empowers the executive even more. Yeah, I always like to say it's really easy to manage a caucus of one, mm-hmm. um, but a caucus of you know sixteen is difficult. A caucus of fifteen could be very advantageous to the incumbent governor. And, and it hasn't been since the 1860s, but I think it's been since the 1960s since Arizona had a majority legislature that was Democrat. Yeah, I think it's 66. Wow. I remember the last time. So I went to work for Grant Woods in 1991 and the Democrats controlled the Senate. Uh, Pete Rios um, uh, was the president of the Senate back then. And it was a split chamber. And that's the last time, uh, you know, we had a majority. We had a tie there for a couple years, I think sometime in the 90s. <clears throat> but uh, that was the last time the Democrats controlled the chamber. Hmm. So um, the Democrats have to be careful how they play this hand that they've been dealt. I mean, just going on and on and on about how Republicans in position of power is, is an assured way to reduce women's rights. Uh, you know, if you just keep harping on that over and over, is, does that not work for them? And do they have to you know, mold and and carefully shape their message on abortion through the rest of the year? 
Yes. I mean, th- there's a there's a temptation here, as you began the show with, yeah. with the discussion of what happened yesterday, with a temptation to overplay your hand mm-hmm. um, and allow the cycle to play out um, and, and see what else matures. But uh, clearly this issue, as I said at the top, puts some wind in their sails. But you don't want to overplay it, because I suspect the ground underneath us will shift again between now and election. Election Day. Right. There's some. There's a, an opportunity for the 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 um, for the attorney general or other plaintiffs to appeal that underlying ruling. I suspect they will within this 14 or now 65 day period, and so we'll see some shift there. But you'll you'll also you know it, it's still not the number one issue. I mean, it feels like that right now. Right. Just this week because we've had a <laughs> seismic event take place, but. Housing is still an enormous problem in Arizona. I would say it's probably the second most popular issue. And then go back to that old saw that's been around since uh, the 2008, the border. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and the problems that uh, confront the state with its border relationship with Mexico. Um, let, let's talk about Republicans. How, how do they shape their message, uh, <laughs> at least in the short term, on uh, when it comes to abortion? Uh, Warren Peterson was on the Mike Broom head show yesterday saying he's glad we're back to the 1864 yeah. law that's uh, yeah. I, I, if i was still consulting republicans i'd say that is a losing message well you and i are on the same boat there <laughs> yeah. so so yeah thoughtfully they would they would tact they would tack to something closer, getting back to that existing state law mm-hmm. that was in place, that 15-week abortion ban that was in place before, that addresses the late-term abortion issues and addresses all that. But I, Jim, like you just said, with Warren's statement yesterday and then Toma issued a state statement last night, in order to migrate to that position, they would need the support of both the speaker and the president. And I'm not feeling that. Um, because the rules of the legislature are that that the speaker and the president of the majority have to be on the winning side of any issue. And I'm not feeling that kind of movement there. Yeah. So, you know, the question becomes, can you take the floor away? Can you man- can you maneuver uh, uh, to get the floor away? We saw a bit of that uh that was the, the histrionics yesterday. That. Yeah, was um, Mr. Gress moved uh, to to hear a bill. Um, And there's only two motions that can override such a motion, and that is to recess or to adjourn. And we saw both of that happen yesterday. And so uh, I think it was an opportunity to give them time to think about it, uh, to think about what the ramifications are here electorally. But I suspect, you know, with the passion that exists on the right, And the religious fervor on the right about this problem of life Mm -hmm. uh, that that the the organizational interests that support the Republican effort, namely the Center for Arizona Policy and their deep, deep um, roots and and relationship with the Republican Party, that they will not be given permission to do that, much less would they want to do that. And so I suspect that that's going to come up in a fruitless exercise and. I think the Democrats were calling out Gress yesterday because they sensed the same thing, yeah. that he was just being performative about it. So they were like, well, we can trump your performative <laughs> and we can go call you, you know, shame on you for his fetal, you know, his fetal personhood bill, which he introduced last year. And right. so, you know, there's I know it shocks you to see that there's hypocrisy in politics. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, that, <laughs> se- that seems to be the order of the day for now. This may all become moot, Um, all these arguments and everything, if a constitutional amendment, uh, well, first it has to get on the ballot, and there's going to be legal challenges to that, although it appears that uh, the folks behind that idea of an Arizona constitutional amendment that um, permits abortion up until the point of viability of the fetus outside of the womb, um, they have the... It looks like they've got the signatures to get it on the ballot. So short of a, of a legal challenge that they would lose, um, Arizonans will have an opportunity to vote on it. If they vote that in, all this other wrangling over the state Supreme Court and all the laws, this becomes the law of the land. 
Correct. Um, they have, uh, by all counts, the reproductive rights movement has uh, collected over half a million signatures. They're going to continue, by all accounts, to collect those signatures, which means by the time they file, deadline to file is July 3rd. Mm -hmm. um, they've made an appointment <laughs> at the Secretary of State's office to file their signatures on July 3rd at 9 a.m. I would suspect they will have uh, upwards of 800,000 signatures to file. They need 394,000 signatures to make it. That's well above any threshold. So they'll, there will not be a challenge on their signatures. I'm right. confident of that, which means they will be on the ballot. Um, and then you'll have this issue of, of uh, a legal challenge post post election right um that is available to the opponents of it if so, there's more than one item on the ballot uh, on the ballot issue or if it's written incorrectly or if right. there's some remember the one a couple years ago that uh was uh the income tax provision right which passed and then it was ruled unconstitutional because they didn't write it the right way i suspect that's going to happen i don't suspect they will prevail but remember Remember the court you're dealing with. Right. The court you're dealing with here is a Ducey court. You mean the opponents to the yes, to that. yeah. The the yeah. court that the Supreme Court that will hear this is very conservative. Um, it's uh, five um, Ducey appointments and two Brewer appointments that are still on there, mm -hmm. and um, you would suspect that there will be a vigorous challenge. But I, I you know, I'm not a lawyer. I, I can't even. My dad was. God bless him and rest his soul. But I'm not, and we'll see how that all plays out. So we, we talked about the, the state, you know, the state implications, state politics, and this is still state politics. It's statewide politics, but it's yeah. now we're, let's step up to the federal level and talk about how the abortion issue affects the U.S. Senate race. Um, Carrie Lake pretty quickly came out and denounced the 1864 <laughs> law after the state Supreme Court decision. But this is something she said was, I, I'm going to quote her correctly here, uh, she actually called it a great law two, two years, years ago, ago when she was running for governor. Yeah, you, you heard the OSHA backup horns uh, flip on <laughs> and, the, and the equipment started moving yeah. backwards yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, the instant this hit the deck yeah. because Republicans uniformly see this in a competitive race. You know, most legislative races are not competitive, so you're not going to hear it from them. But in a statewide race where it is a viable uh, opening for a Democrat to win in a statewide race, as we witnessed in 2022, mm -hmm. um, that this is not good ground to fight on. So she's going to cede that ground and back away from this and try to try to re uh, reimagine the landscape in some different form. I think what will happen, I mean, my instinct, what will happen is the, the current law will be reinstated prior to the cycle commencing here further. Okay. There's a 14-day opportunity uh, for the proponents of abortion to appeal the Supreme Court's decision. Planned Parenthood specifically. Yeah, well, they, and, the, and the Attorney General. I right, mean, right. They, they could go down, because they wrote it. I mean, the, the court wrote this into the ruling, almost inviting the argument to be made in Superior Court in Tucson on the constitutionality of the underlying law, the actual mm -hmm. constitutionality of the 1864 law. And so um, I suspect in the next 14 or so days, there will be a filing made. I can't imagine the court rejecting the opportunity to hear that case. Right. So they will ask for a stay to give them the authority to argue the underlying case. That stay will be in place until you, if the judge grants it, until such time as they are able to argue the case. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that's pushing that window really up close right. to the election. Trials don't happen the next day on stuff No, because like yeah. you got to brief it, you got to argue it, you got to do all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and so it'll be very interesting to see. But I suspect that that. We will not be living in this crisis moment uh, in another two weeks. We will we will see a window, but where the other thing will be reinstated. But doesn't that also yeah, it does. extend the debate? It does. I Maybe mean, on till election day. Exactly. The narrative then is your whole right is in jeopardy. 
and here's your out. Here's your exit. Mm-hmm. This is your exit plan to support this constitutional amendment, which is put before you and end all of this debate once and for all. And I think with the amount of anxiety in the electorate with regards to a woman's right to control her own body, um, that is certainly um, uh, puts as I started at the beginning, a significant amount of gale force winds behind the uh, the effort. And uh, let you know, we should talk about Ruben Gallego on the Democratic side as well. Does you know, he quietly left the progressive caucus, (laughs) you know, uh, at the end of last year. He's been trying to reshape his image a bit here and there. Um, Does he come out as more moderate on abortion and back that 15 week law? I don't think so. Uh, I think that would be a betrayal of his aforementioned progressivism. Yeah. And it's just not something Democrats feel any Democrat feels they need to do right now. Yeah. Um, They're not playing defense on this issue. They may be playing defense between now and Election Day. But I think there's a significant amount of impetus behind uh, this initiative. And I he knows that. Um, And. Betraying his progressive nature, I don't think he's going to all of a sudden become a friend to the Republican Party by by fixing their uh, their problem for right, them. Right, right. So I suspect this is good news for him um, that this is a front and center issue now. But again, you'll have immigration, you have housing costs, you have inflation, you have all these other issues that are on the deck that'll be topical during the course of his cycle. But he's, uh, as you noted, he is. Uh, Fortunately, he comes from the smallest congressional district in the state, right. lowest turnout. He doesn't have a high name ID statewide. He's got a lot of money, and he's doing a really good job right now of narrating his candidacy on our airwaves. Yeah, bootstraps, you know, single mom working throughout his his young career, Marine Corps, going to college at Harvard, yeah. go, is serving in the Marine Corps. You know, in one of the most heavily damaged units in the Iraqi war. Yeah. Um, he's got a good story. And and I think the more you tell that to people, um, the more uh, they will be they will warm to him. Um, she's going to try to frame him as a progressive liberal um, that's out of step with Arizona politics. I think that's going to be a hard thing to do um, because he really doesn't. You just said it. He was a member of the Progressive Caucus, but he doesn't have a policy record that's really as a result of being, you know, in the in in the House. Right. It's not like he's led the charge on a bunch of stuff, um, and I think it gives him ample room to frame his candidacy in a way that appeals to, like Kelly did, like Cinema did. Maybe not as much as you yeah. know. I don't think he's going to tell the Democratic Party to go to hell. No, no. Um, but you know, he he has a. A, a, a clear path that's laid out um, for him by the last two elections on how an, how a Democrat wins a statewide election in Arizona. And also, it's uh, easy to not look like an uber liberal when in the same delegation from your state, you have Raul Grijalva, too, yeah, right? So, I said that right. somebody yesterday. <laughs> Did you? They, they, said, yeah. they said, well, you know, uh, it, was, it was Republican and uh, who you know, and I know. And she, well, he's just the most liberal. I go, he's not as liberal as Raul. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was immediately yeah, backed yeah, away yeah, from. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so he, he and he doesn't have that veteran status as Raul and right, others. Right. You know, and he's going to get the support of, you know, Janet and Paul. Tano, Bruce Babbitt, Dennis DeConcini, mm-hmm. I mean, longtime Democrats yeah. that don't re- reflect truly that progressive nature of the Democratic Party as it exists in some circles today. Do you want to talk about anything else before I let you go uh, regarding the 2024 election other than abortion, which I know well, there'll hey, be a lot of issues. hold the whole thing. There'll be a lot of issues on the ballot. I'm trying to get one on the ballot as long as I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Trying to make elections fair, which should create and uh, treat all voters and all candidates equally um, and uh, you know eliminate the different signature requirements to get on the ballot, eliminate all partisan primaries. So we'd have one partisan primary and voters can choose. I mean, I've always wondered in my life, you know, why do we use taxpayer money to fund two private parties when 
most of the electorate now, uh, nearly a third of the electorate, is unaffiliated. They're leaving these two parties, yet they use my taxpayer dollars to run their elections. Yeah, actually, and, the, the, yeah. the it's not the majority, but it's the plurality right. of, of registered voters are not, are not a member of the Republican or Democratic Party. So why do we bless their... P- Just throw everybody on the ballot. Let the best man or woman standing at the end of that win. We don't prescribe how the general election is going to work. We, we tell the legislature they can do any... any any, any up to five, they could move five forward and they could move two forward. But it's not our call. It's their call. Because in my view, anything is better than the current system. Because today, you know, the extremist uh, element of both parties, 80 percent, I don't think most people get this, 75 to 80 percent of all legislative elections, inclu- you know, including Congress, you know, when you break it down into a legislature, 75 to 80 percent of those people have no general election competition yeah. because they're yeah. in safe districts. So having a Democrat run against a Democrat or a Republican run against a Republican, I want choices. There you go. You know, yeah. the only industry that that's, uh, that's uh, that, that is immune to competition is the is the politics industry, and so let's ha- let's use good old American innovation, and let's see what happens. Let's let's reset the table and see how people react. It it's, it's does sound a little confusing, but as long as you're not suggesting we go to parliamentarian no, kind no. of politics, uh, I guess no. I'm down with it. So. No, but I really think this will give an opportunity um, for a two party system to reset itself because you're going to have to be a pe- you're going to have to appeal to a majority of the electorate. Mm-hmm. You you cannot just appeal to a minority uh, of the electorate. You know, people who get elected. I, I mean, I've literally had members uh, tell me. You know, I point out that well, this issue got more votes than the governor in your district. And he goes, I've had him bluntly say to me, "Well, that doesn't matter. I don't run in the general election. I win my race in the primary. I don't care." I mean, at least it's honest. <laughs> and so I want to make sure if we pass the Make Elections Fair. Act that we we f- force every district to have competition and nobody can win their race outright in the primary because having uh, elected representatives that represent a majority of the electorate will solve some of our problems. It's not a it's not a magic elixir. It's, right. it's just allowing competition to take place uh, and and eliminating politics, partisanship, you know, one party or the other party uh, from dominating the show. So I think it's going to be really helpful. I'm confident we're going to get it on the ballot. I'm confident we're going to get it passed. I've been blessed with, um, I mean, we've raised over six and a half million dollars just from Arizonans. I mean, I haven't, I've not gotten a contribution from anybody outside of Arizona. Wow. And that's a testament to the awareness of the problem and the passion that people have for our democracy and restoring it to where it ought to be, where voters are in charge. All right. Um, thanks, Chuck. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Chuck. absolutely. It's a pleasure and, and, talking to you. And good luck uh, on that campaign. Thank you. Uh, and good luck to all of us here in Arizona. Uh, it's an exciting cycle. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a crazy cycle. I I said earlier this week that I don't know if abortion will overtake the border and the economy as the number one and number two issues in the 2024 election, or if it does, if it will stay there. Chuck pretty much said the same thing moments ago. But I do know that there are people who feel very strongly about abortion, whether they are pro-choice or pro-life. So... I choose to keep my beliefs on abortion to myself. One group of people we know won't do that are politicians, but I hope they don't lose their minds while talking about the people who hold the opposite view, and I hope we don't let their words influence how we feel about each other. So please, just remember, despite what the fire-breathing politicians have to say about the other side, most people on the left who support abortion access don't do so because they want to see babies killed, even though that is what some right-wing politicians want you to believe. And most people on the right who want to restrict abortions aren't secret fascists who are wringing their hands with evil joy over the prospect of controlling women's bodies, even though that is what some left-wing politicians want you to believe. And remember that politicians on both sides say these things to muster votes. Yes, there are exceptions, like abortion clinic bombers on the extreme right and the people on the extreme left who insist 
insist that taxpayer-funded abortions should be available up until three minutes before birth. But those people aren't your neighbors. They're not your mom, your dad, or your cousin. And politicians don't care if you rip apart your family and your friendships if it means they win an election. Thanks for watching this week's AZ Political Podcast. Thanks to my guest, Chuck Coughlin of High Ground. And we will see you next week on the AZ Political Podcast.